Aloha. Good morning. It's January the 5th, 2022, the new year. Welcome everyone, and I hope everyone has a safe, healthy, and prosperous new year. Today's title is, well, if I can find it, uh, U.S. Democracy Can Vanish. You can stop that. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And I'd just like to start with this title because um, our, our democracy seems to be in jeopardy. And it seems to be vanishing before our very eyes very slowly at a very slow pace. You know, back in uh, 1787, when Ben Franklin walked out of Constitutional Hall, he was asked a question. He said, the question was, doctor, have we got a republic or a monarchy? And Ben Franklin said, a republic, if you can keep it. Well, the question is, can we keep our republic? Can we keep our democracy? And, you know, those who think with American exceptionalism that our democracy is bold and bright, has served as a beacon for uh, hundreds of years for the rest of the world to admire and behold. Um, American exceptionalism is just that. It's, it's, it's rather arrogant for us to continue to believe that because right now we've been taken off the list of the most democratic nation in the country. We have been taken off that list as of recently. And if those who who are arrogant about our democracy and think nothing can tamper with it, well, let me remind you of a fact that happened uh, back in the 1940s. With a uh, snap of a finger, or in this case, uh, the, the ink of a pen, uh, for 120,000 Americans, their democracy was usurped, taken away from them in a moment. Uh, Executive Order 9066, on February the 19th, 1942, President uh, Franklin signed that order and 120,000 Americans lost their democracy. They lost their rights for their freedom, uh, their property, and they are incarcerated for three years. So let's not be uh, too, too arrogant and too cocky about the fact that democracy can go away in a blink of an eye. And so to talk about this discussion about our democracy, I'd like to introduce my guests, Jay Fidel, Winston Welch, and Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Happy New Year, everyone. Good morning. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Jay, to you, uh, we just, um, let me throw you a little curveball here. We just uh, heard Merrick Garland, our United States Attorney General, basically make a distinction between our, um, the, the First Amendment rights to freedom of speech versus the uh, threat of violence or actual violence to prevent uh, our democracy from flourishing. What was your impression of Merrick Garland's uh, discussion this morning and his uh, commitment to keep democracy alive in the United States. Uh, we're going to put uh, Merrick Garland's photo and the link to that discussion on uh, tomorrow's daily, our uh, Think Tech Daily. But um, I only saw a part of it, and I have three reactions I would mention. Number one is um, it's about time. Sorry. Um, you know, we've been talking about it. We've been fetching about it here. Um, on America, what's what now uh, for months? Um, and he's been attorney general for a year. And this is the first time he approached, um, you know, making, I guess, in his view, a stirring, stirring speech. That's the first reaction. It's a little late, actually. The second reaction is that uh, he must have been under tremendous pressure by the Biden administration. I can just I can hear the discussion in the Oval Office now that went something like, uh, Merrick, you got to get out there, man. Everybody's talking about you. They're all saying you're a wimp. Uh, what about getting out there and showing, you know, showing a little a little metal? Um, I'm sure that happened. And the third thing I, I get is that for Merrick, who is not a stirring speaker, I, I'll go on record with that. Um, Mer Merrick said around halfway through the speech, he said this. He said, quote, we're all Americans and we've got to protect each other, end quote. And for Merrick Garland, that is stirring. I was stirred by that. I was stirred with some of the other things he said, too. We have waited a long time for him to speak. We have waited a long time for some high public official to say that. And um, to hear it said was stirring. And I, I got email from people this morning, including some hosts of other shows on ThinkTech, uh, saying, gee whiz, this is memorable. Um, so it's a good thing on balance. You wish he had more fire in him, and you wish he had done it earlier, and you hope he'll do it some more in the future. 
But the Department of Justice has huge power, huge prospect in terms of dealing with the insurrectionists, including Trump. Um, and it's not at all clear that it's doing that. You know, before we started the show, you know, I said I didn't hear him say anything about Trump. And Tim, you responded by saying, well, he didn't say anything directly about uh, about Trump, but he said he would follow the facts wherever they go. He would prosecute, you know, whatever whatever came out of this. And um, I, I'll hold him to that. I wish he'd been more specific about it, but I'll, well, he did I'll say hold him to that, that. Uh, he did say that he's going to hold accountable at any and all levels. And okay. they follow well, the facts that, wherever they lead. So that, must that was uh, encouraging. So, but, you know, I mean, it's it really uh, serendipitous that you should pick the title you picked for today's show. Uh, you, again, uh, is U.S. democracy vanishing? Uh, and then the first part. Uh, the second part is, can we stop that? I got a, a few thoughts about that, too. Um, bottom line, this is the issue of the day. And although climate change is important and the various elements of Biden's uh, legislative package, they're important. But right now, it's it's a matter of um, addressing our democracy and whether we can preserve it and how fast it is sliding down the hill. No question, no question that it is sliding down the hill. Um, but how fast uh, you said you said in your opening remarks, Tim, you said at one point, well, it moves slowly, and then the, you also said that it moves fast. I'm in the fast category. I think that when it reaches a certain tipping point, it can happen virtually overnight, depending on the events involved. So I think we have a major problem, um, and um, Merrick Garland could be a solution, um, but we have a major problem. We all ought to be aware of it. All right. One last follow up on this is, you know, I've been listening to a lot of interviews in the last few days, particularly re regarding the uh, the anniversary of January 6th. And the, the experts who study um, autocracies around the world and and the transformation from democracy into autocracies, um, they know that the number one thing that is cited as to the beginning of the end for a democracy is apathy from the, the public, from the citizens of that country apathy that their de democracy is not vanishing. And Merrick Garland actually made reference to that. He said, you can't just rely on the Department of Justice for the uh, maintenance of democracy. It is the responsibility and rights of every citizen. Um, what was he referring to, do you think, when he made that statement? Was it, was it accountability to the elected officials that the public should give um, pressure, maintain pressure on the electric officials for not speaking out when democracy is challenged? or? Uh, is it something more than that, Jay? Well, this goes to the second part of your title. You know, what can we do about it? Um, and the answer is, uh, you know, we, we've heard so many times that the, the, the franchise, the most important franchise for all of us is to vote. But voting has been undermined horribly by the Republican, you know, legislators and activists uh, in so many states. So it's, it's not clear that voting is what he's talking about. I think what he's talking about is uh, is stuff like this, like think tech, like writing op ed pieces, like facing people and telling them they're they're wrong about their views over mm, failure of democracy, of their 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 actions to undermine democracy. It's like uh, I think he would say if he were with us now, it's like everybody's obligation to take every opportunity possible. Because if we don't do that, we as a group of 330 million people, if we don't do that, we are turning our backs on it and we will seriously regret that. Let me add that the violence, the violence that he spoke of is very, very important because one of the indicia of the failure of democracy, or for that matter, the transition to another form of government or anarchy, which is more likely in this case, is violence. And I don't think people fully understand that if you want to transition to some other kind of form of government because you're abandoning democracy, you will pay a horrendous price. One is you won't be able to find a dentist. This is very important. Uh, the, other, the other is, you know, you may have trouble finding food and water. You may not have the Internet. You may be unable to talk to your, your community, so to speak. You may not find gas for your car. You're going to be sitting at home worrying in fear about what happens to you. That's the price of transition to chaos or chaos itself. So I think, I think what he was talking about is right now, the obligation to do something right now. We, we can't be on the sideline. And that means everybody.
It, you don't have to have a PhD to know what to do. Get out there and, and, and preserve our democracy. Unfortunately, for some people, this is harder than for other people. For us, I think we're in it and we have demonstrated an awareness and an interest in it. And what we are doing is really valuable if you measure it by what Merrick Garland was saying. Thank you, Jay. Winston, um, to hit on Jay's last point is, you know, the responsibility of our citizens to do something about it. Um, I guess it goes to the question is, do, do a majority of our citizens in this country even know what democracy is and what it looks like and, and what shapes our democracy and what is the history of our democracy? Um, do we have an education uh, void, if you will, or a, a puka of education that people aren't even unsure what democracy means anymore? Well, I, I, Jay laid out a pretty compelling case about what it looks like. And, uh, you know, I, when you were saying about American exceptionalism, I, we, we have been the shining city on the hill for a long time. Are we perfect? Have we been perfect? No. Have we made serious missteps? Yes. Are, are we continuing to make them and faster? Yes. Um, but I don't think we should minimize the impact that this nation has had on the world and hopefully for the better. I mean, I, I believe that it has been and uh, and it's time to get our own house back in order. And the wonderful thing about this nation is that we can take the deep dive looking inward and making sure that things are uh, hopefully that we're, we're following best practices, as it were. Now, are we? No, uh, this subject of all of our shows in the last couple of years here and many shows on think tech and of course the media every second uh, pouring something out and we have all types of uh, people uh, just uh, flapping their jaws that are really damaging our institutions do does the ordinary Joe on the street. Uh, know? Um, I don't know. Uh, I would think so, but there's been a, a systematic hollowing out of, um, of education we don't have a few media sources where we have a consistent uh, viewpoint uh, as when we were kids, we had three or two stations, you know, ABC, CBS, and NBC, and pretty much the news was controlled. Now everyone has his or her or their own news channel uh, and, and decides what they're, where they're going to get their news, whether it's TikTok or, or nothing at all, because it's so overwhelming because they're worried about getting COVID or having the double shift or, um, you know, uh, stepping over people in the street, or they just see a general degradation of, of life all around them. And when they think about who the president is, you know, it's probably not factoring really high on their list, given their uh, their daily concerns. Um, I, I would hope that I'm I'm wrong about that. But for a lot of people, just the daily grind and survival is enough to occupy most of their time. And a lot of other people simply just don't have the interest or bandwidth to uh, to be uh, actively involved in it. That said, uh, what Jay mentioned about every citizen stepping up to the plate is correct. We need to do so in a respectful, sane manner, not where people are going at school boards and neighborhood boards and, 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 and screaming and threatening people. We need to go there respectfully and say, Madam Chair, I would respectfully disagree with your comments instead of hurling out some epitaphs. So, this, so our, the way that we approach each other and deal with each other has been... Um, really uh, reprehensible a lot of the times so and we see that but th what we don't see and the huge majority of things that we don't see is that our system is working it is functioning we do have most people that say madam chair i would like to uh, make a point i would like to comment i would like to submit some testimony in opposition to um, what the previous speaker has been saying we do have this, and mm -hmm. it just needs shoring up from the lowest levels to the highest levels. We need to get back to a sense of decorum and that we are all Americans, like Merrick Garland said. We have an obligation to protect each other and, uh, and step up to the plate. And I think we have every opportunity to do that this year when we really take a look with inside. Good. But different media sources, I'm not sure that it's going to happen the way that we would like it to. Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me ask you. What do you think is the most glaring example, either since January the 6th of last year or in the last five years of the Trump administration? In your opinion, what is the most glaring example where our democracy has been undermined? I know there's a lot of them, but um, you know, pick, your, pick your favorite. 
my mind just popped. You know, I, I think what it was is it, maybe the since we're one year out from January 6th and you had so few Republicans willing to stand up and say this was an egregious assault on our democracies where their very lives were threatened, literally. And they couldn't come out and say, there's been someone who's fomenting this and there's and we need to get to the bottom of it with a bipartisan American uh, commission to find out what the facts were. That probably encapsulated the previous five years of how um, cowed and uh, subservient uh, so much of our, our of our leadership has become. The slow drip that's, that happened that, that made us um, not immune, but shocked on an hourly basis uh, took its toll to get to that point. So I can't choose. OK, one. well, let me let me interject something here. You know, Liz Cheney uh, yesterday used the phrase dereliction of duty. And when it comes to public officials, the question is, has there been a dereliction of duties of a public officials not to follow their oath of office, which is to defend and defend the Constitution. And when uh, we see egregious acts that are opposed to our, our rule of law and, and the principles of our democracy and Constitution, is there a sense of dereliction of duty uh, from their lack of, of, of citing um, e extreme examples of how things have been breached? I, I, I mean, that's, it's, it's obvious to us that the answer is yes. Um, you know, and, what was also interesting is when you have right after the attack, you have people like Lindsey Graham or this uh, uh, Kevin McCarthy or um, even um, Mitch McConnell saying this was an assault on our democracy, an assault on our very basis of how we live, how we function, how we how we what what are what being an American is. And then very quickly, they snapped around. So what happened in those in those intervening days? They took a poll number and said, hey, I don't have the support that this guy does. And I, if I want to keep my job and my, my pension or whatever it is, I got to line up behind him. It, it's, uh, it was a sad indictment of the reality on the ground. Well, let me, let me jump in and, and refer to Ann Applebaum's article in The Atlantic, um, not quite a year ago, where she examines uh, the reasons that you can have autocracy, autocracies in Eastern Europe. And the leading reason why people continue to serve in governments in Eastern Europe was fear. So if you're if you're asking, you know, what happened between the initial comments those guys made after the insurrection and just a couple of weeks later, when all of a sudden they didn't want to know any more about it, you know, where they didn't feel it was so bad, all the negative statements they made, um, he got to them. He somehow spread fear among them. Well, and that's how did. autocracies go. That's how that's one of those elements that take us to chaos. Sure, he did. But those people that signed up to be representatives and to lead their nation didn't sign up to get death threats. And that's and, and that that makes a difference when someone sends you a letter saying, you know, that they know where your, your kid goes to school or whatever and all the, 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 the insanity that's happened. So, yeah. They didn't sign up for that, Jay. But beyond that, they still had an obligation to speak out. And yeah. uh, hopefully we're, the, the, well, the investigations that we're having are going to reveal a lot more than in the upcoming months. OK, thank you. Um, Cynthia, you know, Mayor Garland in his, his address, if you will, as a speech, made reference that um, any, any threats of violence or violence itself against public officials was not going to be tolerated by the Justice Department. Um, did that give you any? confidence that moving forward, um, be it as a school board or a public official or in Congress, may have the De Department of Justice uh, follow up with direct threats? And uh, the second part of the question is the same I asked Winston, is what point of democracy being undermined do you feel is the most egregious? So a two-part question here. That second part's going to be a hard one to answer. Yeah, I know. That's why I put it at second. <laughs> Um, that first one, well, I'll tell you, the only time I actually barked back at the television while I was listening to his um, address was when he didn't claim he was and it was about the whole threats against uh, sitting, you know, public officials and how egregious it is and how it has exponentially increased over this last few years. Um, and 
he didn't, not only did he not point to the Republicans being, or this, you know, extremist bent being the main, you know, uh, people behind it, he actually said on both sides. And I thought, what? You know, he was referring to media, I think. I think he was referring to media. No, no. At this point, he was referring specifically to these egregious um, threats and attacks and how they're not they're not, um, you know, just limited to one particular party. Yeah, like, uh, he was. But he wasn't saying uh, even even the uh, skinheads uh, are nice people. He wasn't saying that. He was merely saying that he was going to investigate and prosecute without regard to ideology, because this violence was often without regard to ideology. Well, see, that's where I disagree. It is in regard to ideology. These crazy people that are threatening everybody, it's, an, it's a crazy extremist ideology that they have. And, and so that's why, I mean, I guess he had to say in order to stay, you know, and I, I thought that afterwards too. I thought, well, I guess he has to say that because he can't look like he's partisan. He can't look That's true. one side over the other. So I get that. I really do. Um, let's see. The biggest is the biggest egregious thing that is attacking our democracy is the, the, the absolute, I don't know, implosion of the fabric of truth. Truth is no longer truth. We don't know the difference between truth and opinion and lies anymore. And, and that was something that has happened progressively over these last four years that have just really, I think, made all the difference. And, and then trying to turn back the clock is the other thing to try to revert back to those days of Jim Crow. And, you know, people have been saying that Trump administration was, you know, likened to the Jim Crow era and all those policies and, and going backwards, I think is the biggest destruction of democracy. And I have a quote to back up my thoughts on that from Theodore Roosevelt, a very prophetic quote. He says, a great democracy must be progressive or it will soon cease to be a great democracy. All right. That's I like I it. <laughs> Jay, you know, we identify the problems, we identify examples of how the democracy is being diminished. And you hit on a few points early on in the show of what we can do about it. Um, let's go back to that. Let's go back to more concrete examples of what the average citizen can actually do. Uh, I, I, I'm with Cynthia. I mean, um, we can't distinguish the truth from opinion anymore or facts from opinion. And, and you and I have gone around the mulberry bush a hundred times about media's role in this. In fact, at three o'clock this afternoon, we're gonna talk about that very thing is what's media's role in on missing, mashing, uh, confusing news from opinion or commentary. Uh, I think that's why we're in the stew we're in, because over the years, uh, opinion has become fact. In fact, it's been diminished into opinion because there's no firewall between the, a news desk and a commentary desk. But that's just me. Uh, what can the average citizen really think about and do other than um, write to their congressperson and say, please support democracy? <laughs> yeah, I, I was touching on that before. Uh, I want to make it clear that I, I personally do not feel uh, that there is any solution to this. I'm sorry. We are in a transitional moment, and we will, in my view, we will reach a tipping point, and then uh, you, you'll have a lot of trouble find, finding a dentist or food or power or water or gas for your car and so forth. Um, I, I want to say now that it's been nice knowing you guys, all of you. I've enjoyed this time we've had together. <laughs> but if, you, know, if you ask me, theoretically, you know, what can we do? We ought to be mad as hell and say we can't take it anymore. This is an outrage. 
Um, the lies are an outrage. The insurrection was an outrage. What the Republicans have done, and I, I use that name in quotes because I don't really see them as Republicans, what those ruffians have done in, in all these various state legislators is an outrage. And um, you know, part of it, Tim, goes to your point about, about the media. The media should have been outraged. Call it opinion if you want. Somebody should have said something. This is crazy. Um, but we haven't said that. And we haven't heard that either from the White House. Um, we, we ought to all be outraged and we ought to express ourselves. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is um, we've got to have got to have leaders. And I don't know if we have them now uh, who can speak to this, because the world as we know it today is about leaders. I'm sorry to say strong leaders, not autocratic leaders, but strong leaders who will fire us up who will speak to our hearts, who will bring us together. Um, that's why the one comment that uh, Merrick Garland gave that I thought was touching was, was that. It, it touched me because he was saying, we got to get together on this. It's out of Ben Franklin, you know. We hang separately or we hang together. Another Ben Franklin comment. Um, <clears throat> but so bottom line is, uh, I, I don't think anything is going to work. But if theoretically you wanted to make a plan and everybody, at least everybody on the right side of things, or shall I say the left side of things, um, you know, would get together on that plan. It would be something about calling people out when they separate themselves, when they mm, depart from the norms. And we haven't done a good job at that. We can still do it, hopefully. All right, thank you, Jay. Winston, to you, um, same question. Um, wh what can the average citizen do? And oh, by the way, when it comes to media, um, I did go on the FCC's website this morning, and it says, you know, they are strictly prohibited by law not to interfere with the First Amendment, but certainly have the jurisdiction uh, that broadcasters cannot intentionally distort the news and that uh, complaints must be documented before they can follow up and follow up on the evidence to take a, a broadcast or a broadcaster to, to issue with it. Uh, is it time for the FCC to step in and say, um, hey, you guys are distorting the news, be it COVID-19 fact information or um, the election denial that Joe Biden won the election and, and distorting the news and facts that the election was not uh, legitimately gained for President Biden. Uh, where are we, what are we missing as far as government, government intervention, specific, specifically the FCC? I don't see any action on that. And if you pulled Fox somehow, there would be outright rebellion because it's half the it's the most popular news program, so-called news, uh, and it would move to it would move to the internet. And then what are you going to do? Start shutting down things here and there, and then you've got what you didn't want. Um, you know, maybe somehow I think Jay left me hopeful just a little bit at the very end there that it's not too late to stop this, that that when Marjorie Taylor Greene says something that's outrageous, that their leadership of her party comes out and says, this is reprehensible. We censure her. We reject this. Maybe Joe Biden needs to go on Fox News and say, folks, we're precariously balancing here in the nation. We may have difference of opinions on what our policies might be, but we need to really get it right right now and 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 apply the baking soda. And I don't know if they would go along with that or not. Frankly, I I don't have any hopes for that. But the media, I don't know at this point. Like Cynthia says, you have you know what's what's true anymore, and how do you how do you find out stuff? And if you really find, want to find a story and you think you've gotten it right and it's all right, then someone else says, oh, wait a minute, you didn't see these websites, which is the real truth. Um, and so how, do, how does the average citizen discern any of this? I do remain hopeful. Maybe it's going to take something that's a bit uh, more terrible than what happened on January 6th for us to then have to rally around a Joe Biden who just says, folks, pull back, calm down, wake up, start treating with each other, uh, each other with some aloha and some respect for your fellow Americans. And let's get this nation back on path uh, together as best as we can in agreement uh, with, with what we can basically all agree on, which is a lot more than we imagine. Okay, thank you. Hey, Cynthia, we're almost out of time. In fact, we are out of time, but I wanna make sure I get to you and um, pose that question is, what can the average citizen do to try to preserve our democracy? Um, are they left to be 
the feeling of helplessness uh, or apathy? Uh, what can they do? Well, at this moment, Republicans are flooding all of local government. I mean, just pouring in. So get involved on the local level. And I've been talking about this sort of all along here, that we've got to get involved in the local level because that's the only place we can make changes. I want to close with a couple of quotes. Go ahead. People that are much greater than me um, and have spoken to all of these issues that we're dealing with right now. First one is George Washington, okay? It says, guard against the impostures of pretended patriotism. It's one to think about for a minute. Okay, then I've got one from John F. Kennedy. Let us not seek the Republican answer or the Democratic answer, but the right answer. Let us not seek to fix the blame for the past. Let us accept our own responsibility for the future. And then the last one is from Barack Obama. We, the people, recognize that we have responsibilities as well as rights, that our destinies are bound together, that a freedom which only asks what's in it for me, a freedom without a commitment to others, a freedom without love or charity or duty or patriotism is unworthy of our founding ideals and those who died in their defense. All right, well, Cynthia, well spoken. You get the last word, we've run out of time. I want to thank our guests for their thoughtful and engaging opinions and comments. I want to thank Jay Fidel, Winston Welch, and Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Please join us next Wednesday at 11 o'clock for What Now America. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and we hope to see you then. Aloha. Aloha.